I'm Mikola. Oh, Mikola. Nice. Yes. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, so we are resuming our weekly seminar series uh, and today we're very happy to have uh, Parija Day from Uppsala. Uh, she'll tell us about the operator expansions and layer susceptibility in boundary conformal field theory. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much Leonardo for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to speak here. So I'll be talking about operator expansions and layer susceptibility in boundary conformal field theory. So this is some work which I did in collaboration with Tobias Samson from Uppsala and Mikola Spot from Ukraine. So this is based on this paper which appeared last month. So let's get started. So this is a brief outline of what I'll be talking about today. So I'll begin with some basic concepts of boundary conformal field theory. And this will give us some idea about the symmetries that we have when we break the conformal invariance by a boundary and the tools that can be used to compute the data in such a theory. I will then spend a little bit of time discussing about something which I'll call the layer susceptibility and that can be computed from a two-point function in a boundary conformal field theory and this is important because uh, the layer susceptibility is simpler to compute uh, than the two-point function and I will discuss this in detail. I will then highlight the main result of our work, which uh, is uh, the correspondence between the layer susceptibility and the boundary operators. So I'll show that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the layer susceptibility and the boundary uh, data. And it means that if uh, one computes the layer susceptibility, then one can directly read off the boundary coefficients and the spectrum from that. So then I will move on to discuss how all these things work for a specific example. And today I'll talk about how this works for ON model at extraordinary transition in at the Wilson Fisher theory. Now via the bulk uh, expansion of the correlation function, all these things can be used to gain some information about the bulk spectrum for the Wilson Fisher theory. So we will discuss how one can compute the average anomalous dimension in the Wilson Fisher theory for the composite operators of the fundamental scalar fields phi up to a certain order in epsilon. And then I will summarize. So let's get started with the basics of boundary conformal field theory. So suppose we have a boundary conformal field, uh, conformal field theory in D dimension with a plane boundary placed at Z equals zero. And this is defined to be a semi-infinite space. So this is some notation that I will be using. So I will use X for the coordinates living in the D dimensional space time. And due to the presence of the boundary, it will be separated in two parts. So I'll denote by R the coordinates living on the boundary, parallel to the boundary, which is a G minus one dimensional uh, subspace. And I'll denote the coordinates perpendicular to the boundary by Z. And this is valid when Z is greater than or equal zero. Now the presence of the boundary breaks the conformal invariance. So the original conformal uh, group SOD plus one comma one is uh, broken and only a subgroup of this is preserved, which is SOD comma one. Now, under these circumstances, this theory can contain both bulk operators and boundary operators. And by boundary operators, I mean operators that live on the boundary, that is uh, for which Z is equal to zero 
and they are specified only by the coordinates r parallel to the boundary. Now, this is important because this uh, boundary CFT describes surface phenomena in systems at criticality and the operator spectrum of uh, the boundary operators are related to the surface critical exponents. Now, due to the presence of the boundary, the translational symmetry is broken along the z direction. And this implies that the bulk scalar operators can now have a non-vanishing one-point function, unlike the usual conformal field theory, where the one-point function is zero uh, for all the scalar operators. So if O is a bulk scalar operator, this is how we denote the one-point function of this operator. And these A's are the one-point function coefficients of uh, this uh, operator. And translational invariance along the parallel coordinates R says that this can only depend on the coordinate Z. This is the scaling behavior of this uh, function. So delta is the operator uh, dimension of this operator O. Now, this implies that the bulk two-point function under these circumstances becomes non-trivial. So if we have two operators, two bulk operators inserted at x and x prime, and if the scaling dimension of the operator is delta phi, then using the symmetry arguments, one can show that the bulk uh, two-point function can be written as a function of r, z, and z prime, where this r is a difference between the parallel coordinates r1 and r2. And this in turn can be written in terms of a single cross ratio, xi. So this is a scaling function for the two point function. And these are the overall factor, this is the overall factor which depends on the operator dimension delta phi. Now we define this uh, uh, scaling, the cross ratio in this boundary conformal field theory this way. So it depends on R, Z and Z prime. The two point function in a BCFT can be decomposed in a bulk channel or in a boundary channel. So it means that there are two limits of the cross ratio that can be useful. So in one limit, we have two uh, operators, the two bulk operators are close to each other, but they're far from the boundary. So this is the limit when this xi goes to zero. And in the other limit, the two operators are close to the boundary, but far from each other. And this is the limit when xi goes to infinity. Now in the bulk channel, we fuse two bulk operators using the usual operator product expansion. The bulk operator product expansion is a local property of a conformal field theory. And this is not altered by the presence of the boundary. So we write the product of two bulk operators in the usual form. And we see case, so these are the bulk operator product expansion coefficients. And this is some function which is fixed from conformal symmetry. Now in the boundary channel, we use the bulk to boundary OP, where we write a bulk operator as a sum over infinite number of boundary primary operators. So this is how it goes. So where here we have a sum over L, so it stands for the boundary operators. So I'll denote by this hat, the boundary operators. And these uh, are function of R only because they live on the boundary. Mu L's are the boundary coefficients associated with this. So this is a decomposition of the two point correlation function in bulk channel and boundary channel. 
So this is the bulk channel and here we have the coefficients lambda over delta and this is uh, the product of one point function and the OP coefficient. So I will discuss this, uh, the sum properties of this later on. And this is the boundary channel where we have the OP boundary OP coefficient squared, this mu hat squared. Now the bulk and boundary conformal blocks are known in terms of uh, hypergeometric function due to these authors. And this is known in any dimension, D. And this is how it looks. And this is the pictorial depiction of this uh, equation. So here, this is the bulk channel. And you know, we see that two operators interact via the exchange of a bulk operator of dimension delta. And this is a boundary channel where the operators interact via the exchange of a boundary operator delta hat. The boundary conformal field theory is characterized by bulk spectrum and bulk coefficients and also boundary spectrum and uh, the boundary coefficients. So the question is how to compute the boundary data. And also we would like to ask, uh, is it possible to constrain the bulk theory by probing a boundary conformal field theory? I, I think strictly speaking, you need the bulk boundary two-point functions, not just the bulk, maybe that's what you mean by the bulk coefficient, not just the, I, not just, yes. not just the one-point function, you just also no, it's a, yeah. boundary two-point function. Yes, that's what I meant, yeah. yeah. So there is a huge literature on boundary conformal field theory that uh, I have written some of the references over here. So today I will be talking about how to constrain boundary conformal field theory from some quantity which uh, is known as a layer susceptibility. So what is a layer susceptibility? Now the layer susceptibility uh, is defined as an integral of two point function over the parallel coordinates. R, uh, so th this, is a, this is a D is a two point function and we have these parallel integrals over uh, D minus one coordinates R. And this is how we denote the layer susceptibility uh, between the planes Z and Z prime. So this is a, a function of Z and Z prime only. So this connection between the layer susceptibility and the two point function in the context of boundary conformal field theory was pointed out by these authors. Now we know the two point function, the scaling behavior of two point function goes like this. And in, if we insert this here in this uh, integral, and then we do the angle integral over the angular coordinates, then we end up getting something which looks like this. Where this uh, f hat is uh, the integral, that uh, the, the radial integral, which is still, we just keep it as it is. And this uh, coefficient is, uh, it depends on the bulk spectrum, spectrum, the operator dimension delta phi and the space time dimension. Now this rho is defined this way. So it's a combination of Z and Z prime. So we are left with the R integral and we make a change of variable from R to U, where, which is defined over here. So in terms of U, this uh, F hat rho is given by this. So this is identified as a radon transformation of the function f. So if f is a function of u, then we do the integral over u this way and end up getting the radon transform, which is a function of rho. And this is the inverse radon transform. So the inverse radon transform of f hat gives uh, back f, which is a function of the uh, cross ratio xi. Can I ask you a question? 
Sure. Does sure. this also secret depend on lambda, right? To f hat m. Yes. Yeah. This this lambda is here. So that is that like a completely free parameter, or is it like an integer that you choose? No, I just keep it as it is. I don't do anything with it. This is no, just. But lambda it. depends on d, right? You define lambda yes. in terms of d. Yeah. I see. Sorry. Thank you. Can I ask you, these formulas that you are showing, uh, have they been already known to McCavity and Osborne? Yes. Okay. Sorry, is there, I mean, I understand the formulas, but is there some intuition behind this? Why is this a useful thing to do? Uh, uh, I think, um, yeah, I, I, it will probably become clear in the next slide. I mean, in the context of boundary conformal field theory, why is it useful? So now what we do, we consider the radon transform of a single boundary conformal block. So the boundary conformal block is known in terms of this hypergeometric function, which I showed earlier. And if we do the integral over the radial coordinate, this is what it looks like. So we have some prefactors, and these prefactors depend on the space time dimension and also on the boundary operator dimension. And if we look into the row dependence, so the row dependence is in here. Now we introduce a new variable, zeta which is defined as a ratio of uh, the point, the minimum uh, of, and the maximum of the points, Z and Z prime. So in terms of rho, this zeta is related to rho this way. And Sorry, this is exactly- is This is not entirely obvious to me. Why is this true? Uh, you mean, why is this? why the first is definition of zeta in terms of rho and the second one in terms of the minimum and the maximum are the same? Uh, it's like uh, here, this rho is defined over here. Yes. So you can substitute that in the definition of zeta. And it will be written in terms of that combination. This is... It's like, it's like absolute value of z minus z prime minus z and absolute value of z prime plus z and things like that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of zeta, the radon transform of uh, the single boundary block of dimension delta hat looks like this. So this is uh, for a single boundary block, this is an exponent, which is uh, which depends on the boundary spectrum and space-time dimension. Uh, I think that, uh, like, that, does it answer your question, Leonardo? Why is it? Yeah, no, no, I understand. Thanks. So the zeta dependence is here in, in this uh, form, in this power law form, and the prefactors are also entirely determined in terms of the dimension and the yes, boundary spectrum. So this takes us to the main uh, result of our work, which says that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the layer susceptibility and the two-point function in a boundary conformal field theory. So if we write down the layer susceptibility for all the operators present in the spectrum for delta hat greater than zero, and this is the expansion that it takes uh, that it looks like. And the C hats are the coefficients of the layer susceptibility. And here we have the connected two point function in uh, decomposed in the boundary channel. So we have seen that radon transformation uh, allows us to compare the value of C delta hat, to the value of the square of the boundary coefficients. And this is the exact relation of the of these two coefficients 
and it has two important consequences. So the first one is that uh, the existence of a boundary operator expansion tells us that if we compute the layer susceptibility, it will have a representation in uh, powers of uh, zeta with the exponents corresponding to the uh, boundary spectrum coefficient. And another thing is that if somebody computes the layer susceptibility by some means, say, then one can directly read off the coefficients, the boundary um, OP coefficient squared using this relation, as well as the boundary spectrum delta hat from this power. So this, this is true for any general boundary conformal field theory. So now I will discuss how this works for a specific uh, case. So today I'll discuss how this works for ON model at extraordinary transition. Now the layer susceptibility for uh, n equals one at extraordinary transition was computed by Mikola last year using Feynman diagrams up to order epsilon. So here uh, we will extend this analysis for ON. Now the Lagrangian that describes this phase transition in four minus uh, epsilon dimension is this one. So here we have uh, n scalar fields phi i, and these are all uh, bulk scalar fields, so it depends on r and z. And the Lagrangian has two parts. So the first line is the bulk Lagrangian, which is the usual Wilson-Fisher Lagrangian. And the second line is the surface part, which uh, survives only on the surface, z equals zero. And by phi s, I will denote the surface uh, fields which is a function of R only. Now here we have this uh, parameter C naught in this Lagrangian, which is a kind of a measure of the inter relative interaction strength between the bulk and the boundary surface. So this is the phase diagram of uh, semi-infinite system. And uh, we have temperature over here in this axis, and this TC is the bulk critical temperature. And the X axis, we have the relative surface interaction strength, C naught. And there is a special point, which I'll call C special over here. Now, if the value of the interaction strength C naught is uh, greater than this uh, special value, which means that if uh, we are somewhere in this regime, then the surface interactions of the system is uh, not strong enough to produce surface ordering. And the phase transition from a completely disordered state to a completely ordered state takes place along the line of ordinary transition. So this is the ordinary transition. And here the surface is a free surface. And at this special point, when the temperature is uh, equal to the bulk critical temperature, then the surface and the boundary, uh, sorry, the surface and the bulk, they order simultaneously. And this is known as a special transition. Now, if we decrease the surface interaction strength further, which means that if we are in this regime, then the surface interactions are strong enough and uh, the surface ordering takes place at a temperature which is greater than the bulk uh, critical temperature Tc, so somehow here. And in this regime, the phase transition takes place along this line, so where we go from a disordered state to a state where the surface is ordered, but the bulk is disordered. And if we uh, decrease the temperature further, then at the bulk critical temperature Tc, the boundary, uh, the bulk ordering tricks takes place in the presence of surface ordering. So this is a transition from here to here. And this is a line of the extraordinary transition. And today we will be focusing on this regime. 
Now, the presence of the surface ordering uh, in the extraordinary transition implies that the ON symmetry is broken both above and below the translation, uh, transition temperature. So the uh, longitudinal and the transverse uh, part of the field should correlate in different way. Can I ask a question? What is the role of magnetic fields that you had in your Lagrangian H1 for this phase diagram? Uh, they are zero here. They, so this phase okay. diagram is for uh, both the magnetic fields are zero. Okay. So now since the uh, ON symmetry is broken at the extraordinary transition, um, in order, we have to implement that. And in order to do that, we separate out one component of the ON field and we choose this to be phi one, the first component of the field. And the expectation value of this is non-zero. And here again, we use the fact that uh, the translational symmetry along the parallel direction is uh, preserved. So this is a function of only the coordinate z. And this is how we define the two-point function of the longitudinal component. So it has a disconnected part and also a connected part. And the, this part is non-zero because of this. Now the, uh, for the other components of this field, the expectation value, the one point function is zero. And this is the transverse uh, correlation function for all components greater than equal to two. Now this is how the full correlator looks like. So this is a correlation function of phi i and phi j where i and j can take all the values. And it has a decomposition into longitudinal and the transverse part. So here we have Kronecker delta with indices i and one. So it implies that this part is non-vanishing only when both i and j are one, which is the for longitudinal correlator. And similarly, for this part, this is uh, non-vanishing when i and j are greater than one. So we will study the co contracted correlation function, which is given this way. So this n comes from the contraction of the uh, Kronecker delta. Now from the definition of the layer susceptibility, we know that this is given as an integral over this uh, correlation function. So the layer susceptibility also inherits the same structure. So it will also have a longitudinal part and the transverse part. So now we compute the layer susceptibility using the Feynman diagrams. So before I proceed, let me mm, tell you why the layer susceptibility is uh, simpler to compute than the two-point function itself. So for a two-point function, we can have different diagrams. So let's first consider this uh, diagram. This is the two-point function at x1 and x2. And this is a diagram in which both the external propagators are connected to a single vertex x. And this AX is the rest of the Feynman diagram. So here in the two-point function, we have uh, one parallel integral over R and one integral over Z. Now, the translation and invariance along the parallel direction implies that this A, over a, this a of X, it has to be a function of Z only. So what is the layer susceptibility? corresponding to this two-point function, to this diagram. So we integrate over this uh, R12 to get the layer susceptibility. So here we have three integrals. So we have two integrals for the parallel coordinates and one integral for this Z. And this G naught, so these are the external propagators. Now we use some coordinate uh, transformation, some shift in the parallel coordinates 
and also the translational symmetry along the parallel direction so that this can be written like this so here we have used the definition of the layer susceptibility for this uh, two point function and using the definition we have absorbed these parallel integrals and we are left with one integral over z so what it does is that it re replaces the external propagator by the def definition of its corresponding layer susceptibility so this integral is simpler than the two point function sorry but you could okay this is a nice trick but what about just doing going to momentum space in the parallel direction so then that accomplish the same the same feat of trivializing the integrals it's a usual story moment in in uh, for Feynman diagrams that momentum space is, is a little bit easier or is something deeper than that uh, I mean you have transitional invariance in the parallel direction so if you were to yes momentum space that would simplify your your life uh, I, okay yeah no, no, but Leo, I think what I think what uh, the way I understand it is that not only can you go to mental space, but if you are computing glare susceptibility, you only have to do the computation at p equals zero. I see. At infinity equals zero. I see. And yeah. then you compute less susceptibility, and then you reconstruct everything else. I see. So. Thanks. <coughs> so uh, at the level of the two point function we can have another diagram where the external propagators are connected to different vertices so here we have uh, x and x prime and a of x x prime is uh, some is the rest of the Feynman diagram so in this diagram we have two parallel integrals over these uh, coordinates and here again, we use the translational symmetry, which reduces A in this uh, nice form. And the layer susceptibility corresponding to this diagram is again given by this. So here we have absorbed, uh, out of these three integrals, we have absorbed two into the definition of this susceptibility in terms of G. And we are left with one parallel integral. So these are the things that can simplify the computation of the layer susceptibility. Now this is some notation that I'll use for the Feynman diagrams. I'll, so here, this is the one point function. So this is uh, when I use this zero, it means that this is the leading order term in the one point function. And this one indicates uh, the subleading correction of the one point function. And this is how it looks like. And these are the graphical definitions that uh, I'll use in the next slide. So this is a, for the longitudinal propagator. I'll use a straight line, the solid straight line. And I use a cut on top of that for the transverse one. And similarly for the susceptibility, I'll use a dotted one and a dotted one with a cut for the longitudinal and transverse. Now these are the diagrams that we have to evaluate in order to compute the layer susceptibility up to order epsilon. And these diagrams are not very difficult to compute. So we use all the Feynman rules and end up getting the longitudinal and transverse part. And the longitudinal part uh, comes out to be this so as expected it has a power load uh, power series expansion in zeta and there is a sum infinite sum over the uh, operator dimension which starts with uh, the dimension d operator and these are the coefficients now if you look into the first operator of dimension d so this is uh, the coefficient and this is the only term that survives at leading order. So 
it says that at leading order we have only one operator of dimension d and this operator is a displacement operator that we have so due to the presence of the boundary the uh, we, we don't have any kinds of stress tensor but uh, the conservation of the stress tensor is violated by the presence of a delta function on the boundary and uh, this is uh, related to uh, that operator now at the next order in uh, epsilon we have an infinite number of uh, operators starting with dimension 6 and these are all even dimensional operators can, can i ask a question how do you uh, compute this formula do you like take every Feynman diagram and you know how to expand it in zeta what what exactly goes on here uh, you mean this diagram yeah yeah so this diagram so this is a function of z and z prime so we yeah. use the Feynman rules for all these diagrams mm -hmm. and uh, since the layer susceptibility will only depend on z and z prime because we are doing all the internal integrals so we end up getting something which is a function of z and z prime. Okay. What kind of function is it? Uh, okay, I don't have the form, but no, uh, it will not. have uh, some, oh. like, this is exactly this function. It will have some log uh, zeta. So if, if you can see from here, it will have some log zeta dependence and it will have some integer powers as well. Well, this function doesn't have any logs unless yeah it, it doesn't have any log explicitly but this uh, d minus one so if we just put d equals four minus epsilon ah, and then I expand see. it it will have I a see. log zeta i see mm -hmm. okay. so the thing is that we just replace uh, we compute layer susceptibility in terms of z uh, and z prime and then we use the definition of zeta in terms of the ratios of z and z prime and that will directly give us this form. I see. Was this the first time this calculation was done, surprisingly enough? Uh, for n equals one, this was done by Mikola last year. Yeah, but even for n equals one, it was only done last year. Yes. I, see. I would like to say that uh, this function originally contains three kinds of logarithms. A logarithm of zeta, logarithm of zeta minus one, and logarithm of zeta plus one. So uh, zeta uh, uh, close to zero is uh, related to the um, boundary regime, boundary operator expansion regime, and zeta one uh, <clears throat> corresponds to the OPE regime. And uh, zeta two plus one would uh, give us uh, the approach to the mirror point. Mm -hmm. with respect to the boundary and in this form up here all uh, these logarithms of uh, zeta plus one and uh, zeta minus one are expanded with powers of zeta and only one logarithm of zeta is exponentiated up to give this power can you interpret the different k as the contributions of particular operators uh, sorry can you please repeat the question for the each k, can you interpret them as a contribution of a particular operator expressed in terms of the field phi? Uh, yes, so uh, one thing is that, so here it uh, says that it has only even number of, uh, I mean, the operator dimension is only even. So depending on whether uh, the boundary condition is uh, Dirichlet or Neumann, one can have uh, phi, uh, uh, I mean, the in intermediate operator as phi or the derivative of uh, phi. So that will correspond to either even or odd operators. Does increasing k correspond to more phi's or more derivatives? Uh, um, that I'm not sure, but naively it seems that uh, um, yeah, for, for higher values of k, it means that we are contracting with more number of uh, derivatives, yeah. Yeah, this is just a one-loop calculation, so the higher phi's would be suppressed, I imagine. Any 
in fact, here come uh, normal derivatives, the z derivatives, mm -hmm. for the entire uh, k. But is there a unique such operator, or the, or we're really looking at averages here? Yeah. So that that I'll discuss. Yeah, that I'll discuss. From from the boundary point of view, I'm. I'm we didn't, um, I, I'm not sure whether these are uh, unique or not, but uh, from the bulk point of view, I can tell you that uh, these are average operators from some. Do some boundary operators have integer dimensions? Uh, but this is only the leading operator, leading order. It can oh. get corrected uh, next order. Awesome. I mean, this is this is a tower of infinite tower of operators. So, either composed of phi or phi derivatives of phi. Well, you make a distinction between the contribution of the displacement operator, which has dimension d, and the others, which all have integer dimensions. Yes, at, at this order, yes. I guess the point that the displacement operator will remain protective while the others will acquire normalized dimensions. Yes, at next order. Yeah. But we don't see it here. Yeah. Like, this is an expansion to order epsilon, so you might expect contributions of order. So, but, at higher orders, there'll be contributions of order epsilon squared or, um, to the dim before, dimension. But these, these, the coefficients are itself at order epsilon. Right, okay, so that stops you looking at the anomalous dimensions, does it? Yes, exactly. So we can see it if we go to next order in epsilon. Yeah. So uh, does it answer your question? Yeah, I think so. So now what we have for the long uh, transverse part of the correlator is again, it's a power law. And here, the leading order, the leading operator is uh, dimension d minus one operator because its coefficient starts at order one. So what is uh, this uh, dimension d minus one operator? So now, since we have ON symmetry, but this ON symmetry is broken due to this extraordinary transition. So it means that the conservation the con, uh, the conservation equation for the conserved on current this is also broken so this uh, conservation for the on current mm. is broken by uh, broken on the boundary by a scalar boundary operator that is a vector that preserves the on minus 1 subgroup so we expect this uh, to be the analog of the boundary uh, uh, to be the analog of the on current And uh, at the next order, we have uh, again uh, an odd number of operators starting from operator dimension seven. So now we have all the uh, operator coefficients and all the dimensions. So in the boundary channel expansion, we uh, could pl uh, plug all this stuff in and compute the two point correlation function. So this is uh, how the two-point correlation function looks like. So this is the order zero term, and this is the order one term. So it contains log xi, log xi plus one, and also some uh, Li two. So now we want to extract the bulk spectrum from this uh, two-point function. So we expand this two-point function in the OP channel. And we use the external bulk operator dimension as our input. So what is there? You didn't tell us the Radon transform of the bulk block. Is it something nice? Uh, yeah, so the thing that we did, so we computed the boundary block and this is simpler and for the boundary bulk block, uh, we, st we are still working on it. We are not sure whether there is a, a nice form for that too. Oh. But that, that would, uh, if we uh, get some nice form for the 
bulk uh, operator as well. So then that will lead us to a susceptibility in bootstrap equation for the layer susceptibility as well. So we, I, I currently don't know how it looks like. So we are still working on that. So here now uh, it turns out that if we use a different normalization for the OPE and the conformal block, then things uh, become simpler. So instead of this uh, lambda delta, we use some normal, uh, some redefined OPE, which we call A delta. Now, in terms of this small, uh, this GOPE, this is just this 2F1 hypergeometric function with some prefactors. So what it does is that it separates out the contribution which comes from the power law and the contribution which comes from the hypergeometric function. And why I'm, do I'm doing this, it will become clear now. Now in the bulk channel, we expand operator dimensions and coefficients in, expand, in epsilon. And this is a bulk uh, composite operators, phi to the two plus two n. And this is the expansion for the coefficient. And with this, the correlation function will also have this expansion. So let's look at the first order term of this uh, expansion. So here on the right hand side, we get this uh, coefficient, the leading order coefficient and the brackets indicate sum over possible degenerate operators. So it means that for a given n, we can have k number of degenerate operators. And this ang angular bracket says that we have to really take care of the fact that there is a sum over these degenerates. Now we know the left-hand side from the two-point function and we compare both sides by expanding in small xi and end up getting these coefficients. And these are the coefficients, the first order terms. Uh, so, sorry, Parishat, is there any interesting thing to say about the fact that, uh, that the, the two-point function seems to be singular and the limit epsilon goes to zero? Like, is this physically reasonable? Uh, yes. The, because the one-point function is non-vanishing. Uh, it has this, uh, one over epsilon correction term because of the disconnected piece. And that is the reason why it uh, starts at one over epsilon. Yeah, I guess I missed, I guess I missed the first place where the singularity appeared. So I got a bit lost. There. I think the point is that there's no extraordinary transition exactly in 4D. So in 4D, you could impose Neumann or the Riclet boundary condition that would be okay, but uh, you then uh, why is there no why is there no certain the conditions of for... motion the equations of motion box phi equals zero is is inconsistent with a with a non-zero one point function that's right in order to have the one point function non-zero you must uh, take a u zero non-vanishing and when you want to go to uh, four dimensions you go you have to go back to the flowing constant the flowing coupling constant which uh, has uh, different, uh, um, which has different limiting behavior uh, <clears throat> when uh, when d uh, less than four and when d is uh, equal to four. Uh, when uh, when you go to uh, to this limit, you have to change from u to u running, and then uh, this uh, running u has another limiting behavior at d equal to four, and it produces, in fact, logarithmic corrections, not any uh, divergences. And so the profile also will have a logarithmic correction in d equals to four. Yeah, th thanks everyone. There were several answers and I, I think I got the point. Thanks. Should I proceed? Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Sorry for interrupting. No problem. Okay, so now we look at the next order term from the boundary channel. So 
here we have so now at this point instead of matching the full code letter from both sides we will match the discontinuities of the bulk channel and since we already know the code letter the left hand side is simpler and for the right hand side this uh, this term this gop this contains a hypergeometric function whose argument is minus psi and it has a branch cut in the re regime when psi is less than minus 1 uh, however in this expression there is also this log psi which has a branch cut when psi is less than 0 so if we focus on the discontinuity of this equation in the limit when psi is between minus 1 and 0 so in this interval this hypergeometric function will have no discontinuity and the only discontinuity comes from this log xi and this is uh, simple it's 2 pi i so the discontinuity of the both side takes us this to this nice form on the right hand side we are left with this anomalous dimensions which uh, we do not know as of now so now we compare the both the sides of uh, the, after this discontinuity and we end up getting this uh, expression for the dimension now this anomalous dimensions were computed in these papers so let's do some consistency check so what we get here this is uh, some average value and from the correlator that we have we can actually uh, compute the square of this anomalous dimension and it turns out that the square of the anomalous dimension is exactly the square of what we get over here and this implies that this uh, at this level there is no mixing so the, the degeneracy is not lifted and uh, we can go to next order without solving mixing problem so we just go to the next order order and before doing that let's compute the next order op which we can now do easily because in this order we know all the other terms so expanding both sides will give us this coefficients and this uh, n equals minus 1 is the <coughs> contribution from the identity uh, which is present at this order and this is for uh, the coefficient for phi square and this is for the higher values of phi now since we have two orders of the coefficients let's uh, le let's look at the sign of this coefficients so this is uh, some thing important from the point of view of numerical bootstrap so we plot these coefficients so these coefficients are the product of one point function and the op coefficient and this is for different values of capital n and within each graph this direction indicates the i mean higher number of uh, composite operators so this in, this is the increasing direction of small n now for small values of epsilon all these graphs have positive values of this coefficient and if we keep increasing epsilon then after some point we can get negative values of the coefficients and this value is somehow close to um, epsilon equals 0.5 now i i don't have anything concrete to uh, say at, about at this uh, about this at this point but in principle since we know the correlator up to order epsilon one can actually compute one more order, order of this coefficient and try to see how this goes so that it would be interesting to see why this uh, is uh, this starts becoming negative at some value of epsilon hi can can i make a comment sure so so when we did this uh, with the nando gliozzi and collaborators and we use his approach to to study this thing 
I mean, even though it's non-rigorous, we obtain basically the same result. When, when we were playing with these solutions that describes the extraordinary transition at some very high delta value, we also got that one of these numbers had to be negative. Just a comment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, it, it would be good to see why this starts getting negative values after a certain value of epsilon. So. I don't have anything concrete to say about it right now. Yeah. So. But is there still chance that maybe it does not become negative? Uh, if I you include more corrections, maybe it just stays positive. <laughs> yeah, so, so within the Gliozzi approach, when we were playing, of course, with parameters, uh, somehow th the equations were telling us that one of the guys wanted to be negative at some very high value of delta. Um, yeah. And what was the, uh, I mean, order of the value of delta? When it started? 13 or something like this, delta 14, don't remember. But, but here it's the other way around. It's the lowest, it's the lowest guy becomes negative, not the high guy. Right, and, and in our case, we were exactly at d equals three, so so it's not quite the same, but uh, yeah. So you're saying that there's still a glimmer of hope that things could be positive, or we don't know? Yes, Actually, one... I would say the opposite. It, it seemed at least the Glotzi approach wanted to tell us that at d equals three, this, 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 uh, this guy was going to become negative at some point. I think we have uh, to have chance because the analysis of these epsilon expansions should be improved. In fact, uh, we have to resum in some ways this expansion. We have to use at least uh, Pade approximants and we can attach this uh, Pade approximants to the, to the exact values at d equal to two. And then if we plot good uh, plots uh, of A against D, we can say more. But, but equal to two, it is positive after all. So maybe uh, there is a little bit of hope. Yes, and this gives some chance because you have to use some Pade approximate, which goes uh, from uh, Pade approximate with a single, you know, just with one power of epsilon seems a little. In fact, we have uh, three, one. Hello, hi. 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 Okay. okay. I was listening to a talk about when I'll show you your bicycle, which I have to check at the front. You can you turn off the mic? I muted him. Sorry, uh, sorry, Jack. Please go ahead. Yeah. So this is the last part of my talk, which is. Uh, how to compute the anomalous dimension at epsilon squared. So as of now, we have all the ingredients that we need to compute the dimension. And as before, we just compared the discontinuity from both sides. And this gamma two is the only unknown that we have. And comparing both sides, we get the dimensions at this uh, order. And this is how it looks. So this uh, n equals zero is for the phi, uh, phi square, and these are for higher values uh, of um, the of n. Now these anomalous dimensions were computed by these authors at uh, this order, and we can take our results and try to match with their results. And what we get is that for n equals zero, one, and two, that is for phi squared, phi to the four, and phi to the six, we get an exact matching. So it implies that for n equals zero, one, and two, there is no mixing, and the anomalous dimensions are exactly the operators that we got. But for uh, n greater than two, these results don't match with theirs. So it implies that what we get is actually the average anomalous dimension. And at this level, we have to solve mixing problem. 
if we want to proceed further. So it would be good to see how to entangle these operators using some bootstrap technique. So before I conclude, so this is a final comment that I want to make. So for n greater than two operators, that is for higher composite operators, the anomalous dimension at epsilon square, so they appear in the usual CFT four point function, they start appearing at epsilon to the six because the OP coefficient of these operators are suppressed. But here we have seen that if we probe a boundary conformal field theory, all these operators start appearing at a lower order in a two point function. And actually we can probe the infinite set of operators using boundary conformal field theory. So let me conclude. So I have shown that there is this one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between the layer susceptibility and the boundary operator expansion of the two-point function. And so this is this basically implies that if uh, we know the layer susceptibility as a power series, we can directly read off the coefficients, the boundary OP coefficients, and also the spectrum from that. And using this, we can compute the two-point function. And this is useful because layer susceptibility is simpler to compute than the two-point function. And further, using the boundary uh, bootstrap equation in the, boundary, in the bulk channel, this gives us access to a part of the bulk composite operators in the bulk uh, CFT. And we have shown how this works for ON model at extraordinary transition at the Wilson Fisher fixed point. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Many, there were many technical questions, but there may be more. Why in particular does it need to use the extraordinary transition to do all this? Sorry, I, I can't uh, hear you properly. Can you please repeat? I think the question, why did you have to do the extraordinary transition? Okay, uh, this is uh, because the extraordinary transition is uh, something which uh, has non-vanishing uh, one point uh, function. The ON symmetry is broken both above and below the transition temperature. So by probing- You didn't have to do it, but, but it was the hardest to do and this method made it easier. I mean, a lot yeah. is known about the other transition, but very little was known about this transition. In order, yeah, I'm, I'm, I didn't understand why it was so important that the one point function was not zero. So for the ordinary one, the, the one point function is zero. And so, is something not going to work? Uh, the, I, I think the since the one-point function is non-zero, there is a, uh, so the one, um, it starts at order, the two-point function starts at order one over epsilon. So in order to probe uh, the bulk side, you just, it automatically takes you to one less order. So the uh, anomalous dimensions that appear at epsilon square now, in the two-point function, they will appear at order epsilon. So this is some computational advantage that one can get out of it. The ordinary transition was interesting. In the ordinary transition, when you take on the epsilon, the order of epsilon, it's uh, almost trivial, the calculation. And I believe that uh, the calculation to the second order in epsilon will also be simple in the ordinary case. But next to the ordinary, it was interesting because the system is not simple. It has just this non-vanishing order parameter and the uh, correlation function was not known. It was, I think, the uh, single correlation function uh, which is not trivial and which was not known up to now. And now we have calculated this. Mm -hmm. I see. Sorry, can I ask, but uh, 
Can you remind us if, uh, like, is there evidence that indeed there is this uh, second order extraordinary transition in D equals three, also for n bigger than one? I mean, what is known about it? I mean, from the point of view of uh, bootstrap, or uh, I mean, or from any point of view, like, is it known that this second there is even for a uh, n bigger than one, uh, this conformal boundary condition is supposed to exist? Like the extraordinary transition, because you, like even from the yeah, what we did is for n greater than one, so, right? Yeah, and if, I mean, is it known that this boundary condition exists from some point of view? What worries you? Sorry. Well, uh, just that I mean, it's a bit naive, but uh, it's sort of uh, a transition in which you have order in. Uh, towards order in two dimension, like, because you, you purely, you have this ordering purely on the boundary and uh, the boundary is two dimensional. And uh, so, and you, it's like you're breaking spontaneously a continuous symmetry, just in two dimensions. I mean, the transition definitely exists. Uh, it's classical thing, but uh, I think it's an experimentally observed, but one of my question whether it's like, it's going to be something fishy with conformal variance, but I think the transition agrees. Okay, so it's I'm not sure from the experimental point of view whether somebody it's known or not. I, I don't think so. Well, it's also trivial to study on the lattice. Like, okay, just stick your 3D easing model and some put some. Yeah. Yeah. Different. Just put some boundary. I, I think I'm sure people have studied it. Yeah, I mean, I think in the easing case of I certainly agree, but I'm not sure. Also. Ah, okay. So it's OAN, yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Mikola like, knows. Yeah, this semi infinite uh, Ising system, so they, they are, uh, something is known. These are not unknown. Uh, okay, so there are data like uh, simulations that tells you that this phase exists with uh, like only the boundary ordered. You can reach it non local, right? It's not. It, it, it's true that the boundary is ordering first, but yeah. it's not a purely local to the theory. So I don't think that. Yeah, it, uh, theorem. it is not theorem, but I was just wondering. I mean, what is known? The the order at the boundary can be reached in different ways. What Parijat has told us, it was the way when you have a zero uh, external at the boundary and you lower the temperature. And this mm -hmm. is what you, what, which you mean. In D equals to three, you will have a spontaneous ordering in D dimensional uh, surface. But it will not exist uh, for uh, n larger than one. But you can also produce the same ordering by the presence of the external field. And then you will obtain also a similar picture for any n. And also, uh, I should have to say that extraordinary transition exists even in two dimensions in the polymer case. So you can go down from n equals to one to n equals to zero and uh, have an extraordinary transition in two dimensions too. Okay. So, so Mikko, you are saying that in, in n equal larger than one, we are forced to induce this external transition through the magnetic field on the boundary. That's the only way. Yes, H one. That's explicit breaking, so I can. I yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. This, 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 uh, this also explains some other confusion that I had during Perijat's talk because, because Perijat, you said that uh, that uh, you saw in your correlators that there was violation of the conservation of the of the current on the boundary. Yes. And so this was a, a sign that there was actually some explicit breaking of OAN symmetry somewhere. Yes. Because if you just had uh, if you just had C zero coefficient and no magnetic field on the boundary, then it would be very weird to see that uh, that conservation. Then it would be just spontaneous breaking that you, one would expect that current has to be conserved also on the boundary. But now I think uh, with Mikolo's commentary, it makes sense. And also I would like to say that experimentally, the most uh, prominent experiments are in the critical absorption of polymers. 
uh -huh. and very no very well known experimentally and people really measure profiles and so on compares the uh, scaling functions with theoretical data and so on it's uh, really the measurable thing these are really really measurable things experimentally that's refreshing um anything else well i have a question yeah what does the one or epsilon term means and why are they there you had this one or epsilon in your uh, op coefficients so the a minus one uh these these are the just uh, leading correction so, so you have like a but one or epsilon the that is non-vanishing at uh, order one over epsilon this one over epsilon um, disappears in fact in four dimensions because you have to go back to the Ryan coupling constant and in in d equals to four it produces logarithmic corrections no uh, divergency and in four dimensions you have logarithmic corrections you have a mean field theory and so on everything exists everything has been calculated okay i see thanks Could one try to do calculations at large n in d equals three? This. You mean d equals three for O n? But, but at large n, instead of having the epsilon expansion, having large n. Can one write this diagrams like uh, in in the bulk version and try to get something? Uh, there are some. Uh, one over n results in some in, in the statistical mechanics literature but uh, I, I think most of the for the or for the ordinary or or uh, transition right or yes for the extraordinary i'm not sure there are uh, they look at uh, in similar giant, but I... and uh, i am not sure how uh, difficult or easy are these going to be at uh, d equals three for uh, the same uh, extraordinary transition well to three we cannot work directly at the critical point and this is the point because one has to do with infrared uh, divergences and if you want to uh, work diagrammatically in three dimensions you have to use the massive theory and the massive theory is not at the critical point so uh, it's possible but you have to move from the critical point then you can calculate everything in three dimensions in principle and then um, okay then you have to resum things and obtain uh, numerical estimates we have done this in uh, for extra for ordinary and special transition we have done it in 1998 you have cited our paper uh, this thing but i don't know how would it go for the ordinary Okay, thanks. Any further questions? If not, we can thank Parija again and goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Parija. Thank you.